Okay, welcome back everyone to Grokket's OGTV, GMAT edition. That's uh, this over here, Grokket, GMAT. We're going through the GMAT 12th edition to the official guide to the test. Um, 12th edition is the most recent one as of the recording of this. My name's Jim Jacobson, that's me up in the corner. Say hi. Hi to the nice folks. That's me in the cartoon form. Um, last time we left off with uh, question number 103, we're in the quantitative section, the problem solving questions. Um, question number 103 on page 166. So 103 on 166. And I've suddenly realized that I'm not using the template that has my answer choices written on it, but um, so we'll just have to make do with my writing then. A, B, C, D, E. Okay, eight. So the present ratio of students to teachers at a certain school is 30 to 1. If the student enrollment were to increase by 50 students and the number of teachers were to increase by 5, the ratio of students to teachers would then be 25 to 1. What is the present number of teachers? So first off, we want to identify our variables. We'll have s equal the students. I may have mentioned before that s is not the most awesome variable to use at all times because of its resemblance to a 5, depending on your penmanship. But, um, you know, we'll make do. We'll just be careful. My s's do look kind of like my 5s now that I look at it, but, you know, I'll remember, hopefully. Um, and we'll use t for our teachers. So the first thing we find out that is that the ratio of students to teachers, remember you can write ratios as fractions. So s to t is the same thing as s over t. S over T equals 30 to 1, like it says. We also know that if the student enrollment were to go up by 50 and teachers went up by 5, the ratio changes. So keeping that same ratio of S over T, if the student enrollment goes up by 50, we add 50 to S. And if the teacher, so it's S plus 50, and then if the teacher um, number of teachers on the faculty goes up by 5, that's T plus 5. And that ratio equals 25 to 1. 25, not 21. So we have two equations now and two variables, which means we can solve. Um, and we're after the number of teachers, so we're ultimately trying to solve for t. And when you're substituting one equation into another, um, in this case, we're going to su uh, substitute the simpler equation, this guy here, the one where it's just s over t is 30 to 1. We're going to substitute that into this equation. And when you're substituting these guys, um, when you're solving for t in the second equation, you want to solve for s in the first one, because then you can substitute what s is in terms of t. So it's only t's in our second equation. So we want to replace this s right here. So we have to solve it for s equals. So we would multiply both sides times t in this case then, um, you know, to get the t out of the denominator, s equals 30t. So we can put 30t in where we have s over here. So this is 30t plus 50 over t plus 5 equals 25 to 1. It's the same equation that we had before. Um, we can cross multiply then. We multiply that there and that there. Um, so then we end up with 30t plus 50 equals 25 times t plus 5, which then is 30t plus 50 equals 25t plus 125. <clears throat> so we subtract 25t from both sides, we get 5t over here, and subtract 50 from both sides, we get 75 over here, Divide by 5, t equals 15. We need to double check to make sure that that's what we actually needed to solve for, even though I made a point of saying it. Uh, the last question, the last line of the question does say, what is the present number of teachers that is t? Because, you know, said so right here, where we had it. Um, so t equals 15, answer choice e. And we are off to a great start. Let's move on to question number 104. Still on page 166. OK, 
Okay, so six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Straightforward answer choices. What is the smallest integer n for which 25 to the n is greater than 5 to the 12th? Yikes. So um, as you may remember, if you don't have exponents of either the same base or the same exponent, there isn't that much that you can do to compare them. So 25 to the n versus 5 to the 12th. We have to do some stuff to um, straighten this out. Um, and it looks like it's going to be easier because uh, 25 is a multiple of 5. It looks like it'll be easier to do something with this side of the inequality, 25 to the n, than it will be to deal with the... Um, oh, I suppose actually you could do it the other way. Um, but um, yeah, either way. Um, so 25 to the n, remember that when you have... Um, so that you know with, with the, uh, the properties of exponents, 25 to the n is the same thing as um, 5 to the n times 5 to the n. It's also the same thing as um, 5 squared. Remember, because 25 is 5 squared. Um, that thing to the n power. And remember, when you multiply, when you raise exponents to exponents, so 5 to the 2 to the n, um, you just multiply those exponents together and you get the same thing. So that's the same. So 5, five squared to the n power is the same thing as 5 to the 2n. And now we do have these as a common base. We uh, Both of these have a 5 in the big number. So we want to know um, what's the smallest integer n for which 5 to the 2n is greater than 5 to the 12th. So really, um, we need a number for which 2n is greater than 12. If n is 6, answer choice A, um, then it would be equal to 12. So answer choice A can't be it. The next highest integer, which is what the question is asking for, is 7. Answer choice B. Properties of exponents are super important on the GMAT. You need to be very, very comfortable with them. Um, it saves you a lot of stress and nail biting and pulling out your hair. So on to question number 105. Last one on page 166. All right, we have 0 0.10, 0 0.15, Seven, zero point e three and zero point four five. So with decimals that close together, I mean none of them have the same first digit, but clearly we're going to have to do some kind of um, calculation. So sixty percent of the members of a study group are women, and forty-five percent of those women are lawyers. If one member of the study group is to be selected at random, what is the probability that the member selected is a woman lawyer? <clears throat> So remember that probability, probability equals, it's a fraction between 0 and 1 inclusive. Um, the numerator is the desired outcomes, and the uh, denominator is the total outcomes. So if you have a 1 in 4 chance, um, or uh, if, if there's one possibility that you're trying to figure out out of 4 possible total, you have a 1 in 4 chance, or a 1 fourth that can be expressed as a fraction. So we need to figure out these two things. So when you're given percents um, in your questions, it's good to start with numbers that are easy to figure out percents from. Um, a study group, 60%, of course, we could start with a group of 10, but then we find out that 45% of that group are lawyers. 45, if you start off with 10 people, you end, with, end up with half people, which is, well, the math will still work out, but um, we should probably stick with whole people. So whenever you get percents problems, um, and you need to pick a number to start, 100 is your safe bet, because then 60% of that number is going to just be 60. So, 100 members in this study group. Of them, we have 60% are women, so 60 are women. And 45% of those women are um, lawyers. 
So we need to figure out what 45% of 60 is. I'm one of these people who tries to, rather than busting out the long multiplication, I will usually say, well, you know, 10% of 60 um, is 6, uh, and 5% is then going to be 3. So 5% equals 3. Um, and we will multiply that number times 9 to get 45%. 9 times that 5% equals 9 times 3 equals 27. Uh, and remember to figure out the probability, so this is our desired number, this is our um, the number of women lawyers in this study group. We need that number over the total number, which conveniently was 100. So 27 out of 100 expressed as a decimal, because remember all these guys are decimals, is 0.27, 0 0.27 answer choice C. There is a 27% chance that selecting one of these 100 women will get a, or one of these 100 members, you will get a female lawyer. Answer choice C. On to the next page. Page 167, number 106, sorry double check to make sure I hadn't skipped over a question. So we have 96, 75, 48, 25, and 12. So when positive integer x is divided by positive integer y, the remainder is 9. If x over y is 96.12, what is the value of y? x over y equals 96.12 and also that we know that x divided by y equals some number remainder 9. Now decimals and remainders are basically the same thing. Um, at least when I, when I went to school, when I was little, when we first learned division, we just learned to do remainders. Once we learned how to deal with decimals, we started converting those remainders into things after the decimal point. So really here, remainder nine um, is the same thing as the 0.12 that's left over. X divided by Y is 96.12, which means um, Y goes into X 96 times completely and 0.12 times partially. Um, so really it's just a matter of converting both of these into the same base because remainder 9 and 0.12 don't really look anything alike. We can convert them both into fractions though. 0.12 is 12 one hundredths, which we, we can express as a fraction. So um, 12 one hundredths. Now expressing remainder 9 as a fraction is a little bit trickier until you remember how these, how these fractions work. Um, x divided by y um, you know, let's just say it was three divided, by, or you know, uh, six divided by four. Um, it would be one and two fourths remaining. So the remainder, when you express it as a fraction, is always expressed as the denominator of the original fraction. So the remainder, when you're dividing x by y, is going to be nine y, nine over y, nine yths, if, as if y were a number. So 12 over 100 on one side, 9 over y on the other. Um, we can actually simplify from there. Um, we cross multiply, we get 12y equals 900. Um, and then y equals 75, which is answer choice B. So just remember that um, a decimal and a remainder are in fact the same thing. They're the not completely whole bits left over from when you're dividing numbers by each other. I'm not going to promise that this is going to come up on every GMAT question, but it is, you do need to be comfortable moving back and forth between different types of fractions and different types of decimals. Number 107. So if x is the product of the positive integers from 1 to 8, inclusive, and if i, k, m, and p are positive integers such that x equals 
2 to the i times 3 to the k times 5 to the m times 7 to the p, then i plus k plus m plus p equals. My goodness, that problem looks scary. Um, but if we just take it step by step and kind of see what we're looking at, it's going to make a little bit more sense. So we first find out that x is the product of the positive integers from 1 to 8. So that means that x equals 8 times 7 times 6. Come on, give me the 6. Okay. Times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. Times 1, but you know, that's not going to do anything to it. We also know then that we're also we also know that x equals um, 2 to some power, what is it, i, 2 to the i, oh, give me the, there, 3 to the k, um, 5 to the m, and 7 to the p. You'll notice that the second um, sort of value of x, where we have to figure out what the values of i, k, m, and p are, these are all prime numbers. So we don't have to multiply out 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That would, um, that might kind of suck, actually. Uh, you know, not that I'm saying the GMAT wouldn't do that to us, but it's not what we need to do on this problem. Uh, what we are trying to do then, because um, there are no prime numbers in this guy, the top, num top one, the highest prime number is 7. Likewise, in this one, the highest prime number is 7. So really, this bottom one with just 2, 3, 5, and 7, is the prime factorization of um, this. So we just have to figure out how many twos, if we were to, if we were to multiply out 8 times 7 times 6, blah, 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 um, if we were to multiply all of that out and then divide it by 2, how many twos would be in there? How many times could we divide by 2? How many times could we divide by 3, 5, and 7? Those are our values for i, k, m, and p. So <clears throat> I'll write it out with a little bit more room. 6, 5, 4, Okay, so nobody cares about one. Um, there's only going to be one three here. There's one two here. Four is two times two. It's one five. This is two times three. I probably should have rewritten this as a three. And this is a two, so we have to count them up later. This is a five. This is a seven. And this is 2 times 2 times 2. So um, we know that there, so in our um, 2 to the sum power times 3 to some power times 5 to some power times 7 to some power, we know that there is 1 7, which was comes from the number 7. There's 1 5. In terms of threes, we have one from three and one from six. So that's two there. And then we add up the twos. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven twos in that whole thing there. So two to the seven times three squared times five times seven. And we need to know then what i plus k plus m plus p is. Seven plus two plus one plus one equals 11. Answer choice. So re again, rather than panicking when we saw this question that had multiple steps for us to look at, <clears throat> um, one, of the, one of your first instincts when, when you're dealing with things like this is kind of look for patterns. And looking at this thing here and realizing that these were all prime numbers suddenly made this one a lot clearer. It still would have worked out if you had multiplied this out, but it would have taken you a lot more time. Anyway, on to number 108. 67, number 108. All right. A, B, C, D, E. When they've written out the numbers for some reason, I'm going to be lazy and write them out as Arabic numerals. 5, 6, and 9. So if T equals 1 over the quantity 2 to the 9th times 5 to the 3rd, um, if that is expressed as a terminating decimal, how many zeros will t have between the decimal point and the first non-zero digit to the right of the decimal point? 
So really, we're just asking uh, how, how long of a decimal this is going to be. A terminating decimal means that it ends. It's not one of those repeating decimals like, you know, one third is 0.3 repeating on forever. It's going to end somewhere. Um, and I'm just going to write this down. T equals 1 over uh, 2 to the ninth times 5 to the third. Okay. So we, and we need to express this as a decimal. Uh, when you have uh, exponents like this, again, exponents are super important on the GMAT. Um, you can't do anything with, I mean, I suppose you could actually figure out what 2 to the 9th is and multiply it times um, 5 to the 3rd. Uh, and if you're good at doing that in your head, by all means, go ahead. Um, for those of us uh, mere math mortals who have to do shortcuts and, and time-saving devices, um, we need to have, when we have two exponents like this, in order to be able to do anything with them, we either need to have the same exponent or the same base. So remember that um, with exponents, if you have x to the a um, times x to the b, that's the same thing as x to the a plus b. And that means you can do the reverse. And since the 5 to the third power is kind of non-negotiable, I mean, I guess we could split that up, but let's just leave something to the third power. So if we have 2 to the ninth over here, that's the same thing as 2 to the third times 2 to the um, sixth. Suddenly forgot what 9 minus 3 was for a moment. Okay, so we can rewrite this. <clears throat> I'm going to do it over here so we have more space. T equals 1 over 2 to the third times 2 to the sixth times 5 to the third. And let's extend that over. Sorry, it looks a little uneven. Um, and so then we can kind of regroup um, because so 2 to the third times 5 to the third is the same thing as 2 times 5 to the third power. So, um, you know, if we have uh, x to the a times b to the a, probably shouldn't know why, anyway, that equals <clears throat> um, x times b to the a, <laughs> not to the third. So we can use that principle here to have it equal um, 2 to the 6th. And then, so we have 2 to the 3rd times 5 to the 3rd. That's the same thing as 10 to the 3rd. Um, and remember, 1 over 10 to the 3rd is the same thing as 10 to the negative 3. That's how scientific notation works. So t equals here 1 over 2 to the 6th times 10 to the negative 3. Now we do need to figure out what 2 to the 6th equals. Um, you can either just multiply by 2 six times, or you can say that 2 to the 6th equals 2 to the 3rd um, times 2 to the 3rd, because it would be 2 to the 3 plus 3. 2 to the 3rd is a lot easier. Um, 2 times uh, 2 is 4 times 2 is 8, so 2 to the 6th equals 8 times 8 equals 64. So t equals 1 64th times 10 to the negative third, 10 to the negative 3. We're still not done though because we don't know how many decimal points there are, how many zeros there are from the decimal point to the first non-zero digit. Um, so we do actually unfortunately have to divide 1 64th. If you happen to know that fractional equivalent in your head, that's great. Um, and we don't actually have to divide all the way, we just have to see how many zeros there are. So 64 goes into one, well, no times, add a couple zeros. So the first one is there, so 64. We don't even have to do the rest, blah, 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 who cares what's down here. Um, we have one zero after the decimal point here to the right um, in whatever this fraction is. When we multiply it times 10 to the negative three, it's going to add three more zeros in this space between the decimal point and our first non-zero digit. So we get one, one zero after the decimal point from the regular division, three more from 10 to the negative three. That gives us a total of four zeros after the decimal point, um, after as in, you know, to the right of when we 
figure out that expression. Okay, moving on. Number 109 on 167. So we have 8%. 15%, 45%, 52%, and 56%. Okay. A pharmaceutical company received $3 million in royalties on the first $20 million in sales of the generic equivalent of one of its products, and then $9 million in royalties on the next $108 million in sales. By approximately what percent did the ratio of royalties to sales decrease from the first $20 million in sales to the next $108 million in sales? So a uh, formula to remember, a formula not only to remember you know, for the purposes of this problem, but to commit to memory for the GMAT, percent change. Percent change equals the amount of change over the original amount whatever it is. That simple, but it's not always necessarily simple to calculate. So in this case, we need to figure out the amount of change. They went from the ratio of $3 million in royalties over 20 million in sales. We're not going to put the millions in because, you know, I don't have all day. Um, you probably don't either. So the difference between 3 three twentieths versus nine one hundred eighths because it was nine million in sales over 108 million in um, revenues um, or uh, royalties versus sales and then we have to put that over the original amount and the original amount is that ratio of 3 over 20. So uh, it does help to do a little simplifying um, nine one hundred eighths 9 over 108 is the same thing as 1 12th. So we have fractions that are easier to deal with here. Um, and remember, when you divide by a fraction, it's the same thing as multiplying times its inverse. So this whole thing equals 3 20th minus 1 12th. That whole thing times the inverse of the denominator, which in this case then is 20 thirds opposed to 3 over 20. We can distribute this out, multiplying this guy outside the parentheses times each of the internal things. So this is the same thing as 3 twentieths times that 20 thirds minus 1 twelfth times 20 thirds. This may look familiar to you. If you multiply a number times its reciprocal, that just equals 1. Now with this guy over here, um, we can do a little simplifying of the, uh, the fraction here. We could divide um, numerator and denominator by 4. This ends up being 3. This ends up being 5. Um, so multiply across the numerators. It's a 5 and across the denominators. So 1 minus 5 ninths. Um, which uh, I don't know if I have to do a math for you, but uh, that equals four ninths. But of course, unfortunately, we need to express this as a percentage, not as a fraction. And ninths do not easily convert to one hundredths, so we can just divide nine into four. Doesn't go in. Forty, it does. Um, first digit, we don't even have to go any further because there's only one answer choice that starts with a four. 45% if we actually multiply it out, um, it's going to end up being, you know, 0.4 repeating. But um, anyway, it is approximately 40, 40, 45%. And it's certainly closer to 45 than it is to anything else. So answer choice C for 109. And we can move on to question number 110. have our familiar answer choices on the board. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. 12, 14, 16, 18. 
So if p is the product of the integers from 1 to 30 inclusive, what is the greatest integer for which in the greatest integer k for which 3 to the k is a factor of p? And again, this sounds kind of frightening. The uh, product of the integers from 1 to 30, I do not have enough willpower probably to actually multiply that all out. Um, and it turns out we don't have to, so that's good. Uh, we're trying to figure out what is the largest power of 3, the largest multiple of 3, uh, that's still a factor of that whole number. So really, we only have to add up the factors of that whole big number, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times blah blah blah, all the way up to 30. We only have to figure out what numbers in there are actually divisible by 3, because we're just looking for the powers of 3 in there. So the factors, sorry, the multiples of 3 between 1 and 30 are 3 itself, 6, 9, we just keep multiplying by 3, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, and 30 itself because it was 1 to 30 inclusive. So now we're really only looking at however many numbers this is. I didn't actually count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, I guess I should have figured that out. 10 numbers, 30 divided by 3 is 10. Okay, so there are 10 numbers that are multiples of 3 between 1 and 30. And we just have to count the number of times that 3 appears in, in each of these numbers. So there's 1, 3, and 3. There's 1, 3, and 6, because it's 3 times 2. In 9, there are two 3s, because it's 3 times 3. Um, in 12, there's 1, 3, because it's 3 times 4. 15, there's 1, 3, it's 3 times 5. 18 is... Um, 3 times 6, and 6 itself has another 3 in it, so there's 2. You may already notice a pattern that every third number in our list of numbers here has more 3s in it. So, you know, we have 1, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3s. 1, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3s. So, pattern repeats. There's 1, 3, and 21. 1, 3, and 24. Our third number, 27, is 3 times 9. And 9 itself is 3 times 3, so there are actually 3 3s in that one. And then 30 is 3 times 10. So we just add up 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, and 1, and that adds up to 14. Answer choice C. Being comfortable with um, primes and factors and multiples is another key um, to the GMAT because it also shows up in the data sufficiency side of the quantitative questions. Definitely your friend. Um, anyway, on to 111. So A, B, C, D, E, we have 2 and 1 half percent, 6 and 1 fourth percent, 6 and 2 thirds percent, 8 percent, and 12 and 1 half percent. Okay. If candy bars that regularly sell for 40 cents each are on sale for two for 75 cents, what is the percent reduction in the price of two such candy bars purchased at the sale price? You may remember, because I told you very explicitly that you needed to remember, uh, this formula, percent change equals the amount of change over the original amount. So the prices are um, one at 40 cents, and then the sale is two at 75 cents. How much of a sale is that? Well, in order to figure out how much of a sale it is, we need to figure out what two is at regular price. Well, if it's 40 cents for one, it's 80 cents for two. So to figure out the amount, for cha amount of change between the regular price and the sale price, we figure out the difference. So it's 80 cents. That's a big fat decimal point, so the tablet picks it up. Um, 80 cents minus 75 cents over the original amount, which in this case is 80 cents. I probably could have even left it as um, not have the decimals in it. So that leaves 5 over 80. I'll just take all the decimal points off, 
difference of five cents um, over 80, and we need to express that as a percent. That equals 1 16th, and then we have to do long division, unless you're good at remembering that 1 16th equals a certain percentage. Um, 16 into 100. So uh, goes in six times, that gives us 96, that gives us 40, so then goes in two times, Can add another zero. There. Okay, so and of course 0 0.0625 expressed as a percent, we multiply times 100, it's 6.25. 6.25 expressed as a fraction is six and a quarter. Answer choice B. Percent change is your buddy. You definitely want to have this in your head on test day. Last one on page 167, number 112. Okay, we have one over s, the square root of s, s times the square root of s, s cubed, and s squared minus s. Okay, if s is greater than zero and uh, the square root of the quantity r over s equals s, what is r in terms of s? So when it says, what is r in terms of s, our final answer needs to be in the form r equals blah, blah, blah. And it's going to be one of those answer choices, otherwise we've done something wrong. So we have the square root of r over s equals s. Um, so basically, that means that in order to um, isolate r on its own, the first thing we need to do is get rid of the radical sign. So bye-bye radical sign, we're going to square both sides. The square root of r over s times the square root of r over s just equals r over s. When you square it, it undoes it. And that gives us s squared over on the other side. Now we still want to isolate r, so we have to multiply times s one more time. So then we get r on its own. s squared times s equals s cubed, s to the third. To choice D. Ta da! And now we move on to the next page and we move on to one with a diagram. So, page 168, question number 113. All right, A, B, C, D, E. We have 13 forty eighths, we have 5 twelfths, we have 1 half, we have 7 twelfths, and 5 eighths. Twelfths look like one of our popular uh, denominator options, but we'll have to see what ends up happening here. So we have a diagram. The front of a six foot by eight foot rectangular door has brass rectangular trim, as indicated by the shading in the figure above. If the trim is uniformly one foot wide, what fraction of the door's front surface is covered by the trim? So um, the fraction we're looking for then is the amount, the area of the trim over the total area. And if we have, I'm gonna do some art here, so look out. Let's just pretend like this works. Actually, that's not too bad. So we'll do this. I'm not going to color the whole thing in, but that's the trim. Looks very, very brassy in this artistic rendering. OK. So we know that it's six feet across here and eight feet up and down. So the total area is six times eight. Um, which is 48. So whatever this is, the final fraction is going to be over 48. 
Now, obviously, there is an answer choice that has 40 eighths in the denominator, but since we don't know what the numerator is, we don't know whether it would be possible to simplify it further. We now need to figure out the area of these guys. Um, I forgot to draw the 8. So if this is 8, and it's uniformly 1 foot um, wide, if the trim is 1 foot wide all the way around, there's one here, there's one here, there's one there, and then going across, this is one, and this is one. Which means, if this is eight, we have to subtract three from that to divide it evenly. So each of these distances is 2.5. And if this is six across the full way, subtracting these two gives us four across. So uh, four, so the, the area of the squares, the part that don't have the trim on the door, is two boxes that are four by two and a half, and two times four times two and a half equals 20 which of course is useful, um, but what we need actually is the part that's the trim. This is the not trim part. So um, the total minus the not trim part that's not colored in, which is 20, equals the part that is the trim. 48 minus 20 is 28. Uh, Sorry, trim over, oh right, no, I'm doing this right. I'm just trying to label everything so it's clear what I'm doing here. That equals 28, and that's what we were after up here. So 28 over 48, we can uh, divide the numerator and denominator by four. 28 divided by four is seven. 48 divided by four is 12. Seven twelfths, ladies and gentlemen, answer choice D. You may or may not decide that uh, drawings like this are useful. Um, something like this, where you don't have to do a lot of angles or really very carefully draw to scale, it doesn't actually take very long, and it does allow you to make sure you account for all these things. I'm not telling you that you have to or should um, do diagrams, just that if you want to, it's really not going to hurt you, and if it helps improve your accuracy, it's absolutely worth it. Okay, on to number 114. On 168. 114, not 14. We have gotten further. Okay, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, we have A, A squared, A cubed, A, A cubed squared, a squared, a cubed, a squared. This is almost every uh, permutation of these three um, expressions, I guess. a cubed less than a than a squared. Okay, so if a equals negative three-tenths, which of the following is true? So this question is basically testing your ability to understand what happens when you raise negative numbers, especially negative numbers that are less than one, or, you know, that are between one and negative one on the number line, because special things do happen. Remember that when you raise um, positive fractions to um, to higher exponents, they actually get smaller. The same thing is true of negative ones, of course. So imagine this is a number line. It is a reasonable facsimile thereof. This is zero, and this is one, and this is negative one. If the number starts out in this range, higher exponents make it a smaller and smaller fraction. With a caveat, of course, that every even exponent so like two, four, six, every even exponent of a negative number, the number switches back to positive. 
but it still becomes in, it becomes closer and closer to zero. So um, you know something like negative three is going to start out, or negative three tenths. You know it's going to start out here on the negative side, jump to the positive side, and be smaller. Then jump to the negative side and be smaller, and jump to the positive side. So basically, we have a a squared and a cubed, and this is all for negative 0 0.3, 3 tenths. So um, of these, a squared is going to be positive, a cubed is going to be negative, and a is going to be negative. That makes a squared automatically the biggest number, because it's the only positive number. So we can actually cross off choices D and C and A. Then the question is, which is bigger, A or A cubed? Um, and so remember then that when since the number is uh, smaller than 1 or negative 1 and it gets smaller the higher the exponent is, it gets closer to 0 the higher the exponent is, um, remember that, you know, uh, this is greater than this is greater than this is greater than this. So a is going to be, you know, let's just pretend it's here. A cubed will still be negative, but it will be closer to zero because it's um, becoming a smaller decimal, something that approaches zero, which makes it actually a larger number, even though it's a still a negative number and we're raising it to an exponent. So in the middle here will be a cubed because it will be a negative number that is closer to zero. The furthest from zero and therefore the least number is our original, original number a, um, negative three tenths. So the, the answer choice preserving this relationship is answer choice b. a is less than a cubed, which is in turn less than a squared, which is positive. Okay. Uh, number 115, 168, question 115. So we have 124 percent, 120%, 96%, 80%, and 64%. Mary's income is 60% more than Tim's income, and Tim's income is 40% less than Juan's income. What percent of Juan's income is Mary's income? So the what percent of Juan's income it's, is Mary's income? The final answer is going to be M equals something. So, um, and we're given a couple values here. We know that Mary's is 60% more than Tim's income which means that Mary's equals 1.6 times Tim, Tim's income. One times Tim, Tim's income would mean she has 100%. Anything above that, we have to add the additional decimal. So uh, 6 tenths is that additional 60%. And we also find that Tim's income is 40% less than Juan's income. So um, just leaving that as in the order that it appears in the sentence, his is 40% less, which means it is 60% of Juan's income. Um, so 0.6 J, because you know if it were 100%, it would be 100, subtract the 40%, we get 0.6. Okay, so really then, um, we can replace this here, because we wanted Mary's in terms of um, Juan's income. So we can replace this value for T, because T equals that, so M, equals 1.6 times 0.6j. Um, you multiply it out, 1.6 times 0.6 equals m equals 0.96j, which is what we were after. 96, Mary, was it Mary? Yeah, Mary. Mary makes 96% of what Juan makes. Ta da Answer choice C for question number 115. 116. 168, number 116.
So we have 60, 435, 450, 465, and 900. Okay, each dot in the mileage table above represents an entry indicating the distance between a pair of the five cities. If the table were extended to represent the distances between all pairs of 30 cities, and each distance were to be represented by only one entry, how many entries would the table then have? So, um, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. Um, yeah. Uh, I was just uh, curious what uh, what difference it would make if, if if you did a simple multiplication. You know that there are uh, ten listed there for um, five cities. So if you multiplied it times six to get thirty cities, um, that still doesn't show up as one of the trap answers. So that's good. Anyway, um, so we're imagining basically that this whole thing, you know, uh, blah 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 blah. I'm not really going to fill this in. Um, the whole thing is going to be a 30 by 30 grid because there are 30 cities. We want 30 cities. So a 30, 30, 30 by 30 grid, 30 times 30 equals 900. There are 900 squares in our uh, final grid. Totally, uh, that's the trap answer here because we haven't taken into account the rest of what the passage actually tells us. Um, because it also tells us that... Um, each, each city, uh, each distance were to be represented by only one entry. Um, the other thing we have to take into account that is that with a 30 by 30 grid, um, you'll note even on the grid that we're given here, they don't give the distance from city A to city A. It's not a dot on the map. So we actually need to subtract the 30, 30 blocks that will have each city's distance to itself, city A to A, B to B. So um, we subtract 30 from this. And we get 870. So that's how many are left um, for, for distances from city to city. Um, that doesn't appear as one of the answer choices, thank goodness. Um, but then, of course, it does also say in the passage that uh, each distance would be represented by only one entry. So just like it has in the image, we have a dot in the first row um, with city A and city B. But in the second row, we don't have one with city B and city A. So for this whole grid, half of them aren't actually going to get used. Half of the ones that are left aren't going to get used because we only need to express each distance between two cities once. So we divide by 2. 870 divided by 2 equals 435. Answer choice B. Okay, um, right, I think we have time for one more. So uh, let's move on to 117 then and we'll finish up there for today. Page 168, question 117. And this one, it's probably not entirely appropriate for me to call a question um, ugly. With, when answer choices look like this, you know it's not necessarily going to be the best time in the world because, well, I don't know. I'm I'm in the anti-radical camp. I find them more work than other types of questions. There's more things you have to take into account. But if you didn't have to do that, it wouldn't be the GMAT. So n plus 1 minus the square root of n. And b is square root of n plus 1 plus the square root of n. Okay. So if n is positive, which of the following is equal to 1 over the quantity, the square root of n plus 1 minus the square root of n? Right. So let's actually get that up here so we have it for reference on my screen. Um, square root of n plus 1. Uh, minus the square root of n. Okay, so we need to find the equivalent to this. Really what the equivalent, just looking at the answer choices, almost all of them have no denominator. 
uh, answer choice C is the only one that still has a denominator. So really what we're probably looking for here is something that eliminates the denominator for us. Um, and really we, in order to do that we would probably multiply you know the numerator and the denominator by the same thing um, so that the denominator in some way gets simplified. We also need to get rid of the radicals so whatever we multiply the denominator times needs to be something similar. Very often when you are simplifying things, you multiply simply by whatever is identical to the denominator to get rid of it. In this particular case, we're going to take a little shortcut and save ourselves some trouble. Remember that, um, you know, because again, we're gonna be squaring these and we want to be able to square that guy and we wanna be able to square that guy, but when we multiply this out using FOIL, remember our buddy FOIL, first, outer, inner, last, we're going to end up with middle terms if we multiply um, this whole thing times itself. But remember, the difference of two squares, you can get rid of the middle thing. So if you multiply, so in order to get to the basically x squared minus y squared, which is what we're after here, without a middle term in the binomial expression, um, that's x plus y times the quantity x minus y. So what that means for us in this particular question is that we're going to take this and rewrite it out. M plus one minus four of M. We're going to multiply it times um, kind of the opposite. It's not really the opposite, but M plus one plus the square root of M. So we're, we're, this is our X minus Y and we're going to multiply the denominator times its relative X plus y so that we can get it in the final form x squared minus y squared without a middle term in our um, expression, in our quadratic expression. And we have to multiply the numerator by the same thing because then it's multiplying basically times one. We'll multiply that out. The numerator stays the same. Um, m plus one plus the square root of n. The denominator is where it gets interesting. So remember with FOIL, we multiply the first terms, um, and square root of n plus one times the square root of n plus one gives us plain old n plus one. The outer terms, um, or, you know, well, it doesn't really matter which one we do. Uh, we're going to get um, square root of n times um, the square root of n plus one. I wonder if I have enough room for this. No, I can't erase either. Um, all right, I'm gonna rewrite it on the next line. Sorry about that. And plus, this is the numerator. So we're going to get n plus one for the first terms. The outer terms are going to be um, square root of n times square root of n plus one. The inner terms are the same things except it's a negative. So this is gonna be minus square root of n times the square root of n plus one. And then the last terms is, uh, last terms are minus the square root of n times positive square root of n. So that just equals minus plain old n. So that's the beauty of using this thing here, the difference of two squares, which is uh, you know x plus y times x minus y. These two middle terms cancel out and so we're, we got rid of all the radicals in our denominator. That equals square root of n plus one. Again, we haven't done anything with the numerator. So n plus one minus n is plain old one, which then equals that numerator, n plus one plus the square root of n, which is answer choice, uh, which one is it? E, <laughs> answer choice E. So that concludes our broadcast for today. My name's Jim Jacobson here. You've been listening to and watching Grokett's OGTV GMAT edition, where we go through the 12th edition of the guide to the test, question by question, page by page. Next time, we will pick up with question 118 on page 168. I hope to see you then.